I Okay, kids. So on the last time we had a lecture, we discussed uh, at the end of last shh, the end of last class I talked about um, mechanisms that lead to a macro evolution and I kind of did an overview of some of that stuff. It was very rushed and if you didn't uh, I told you that's one of the things I want to try to improve on and make this a little more interactive, a little better, more pictures and stuff like that. But at home you have all those resources. Don't squander them. I'm going to highlight a folder called Videos and Web Tutorials that's inside each topic. It has animations and videos that describe and talk about the topic in very short clips. You'll be surprised, but even in evolution, that can be incredibly helpful. Right? Um, in addition to that, there is uh, a lot of other, a lot of other um, uh, resources available on my, on my website for you guys to review with visuals and other things. Don't leave it. Right, for a class to learn this material, okay? Because I'm only doing an overview. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about today is about the history that life has gone through and how that started. This, that, this is different from the natural history. Uh, we early, earlier in the year, we talked about the major milestones that happened in the early history of life. I mean, I talked about some of the important early advances, things like evolution of sex, evolution of multicellular life, right? and how those were important steps. Evolution of meiosis and all that stuff. Uh, I talked about how eukaryotes evolved and I talked about the endosymbiotic theory, how we have evidence from uh, that mitochondria and chloroplasts are basically living things and living symbiotically inside of us, all right? Basically midichlorians, all right? Which are the things that give people the force. <laughs> I, it's not even like, like, George Lucas didn't even have creativity, you know? He just remembered high school biology and threw a mitochondria inside the cells of the, the Jedi to explain why they have the Force. Basically, they have symbionts living inside of them that allows them to, to tap into the Force. And they're called midichlorians. So, so they have a third symbiotic event, right? That happens to some of them. And by some Jedi have more than others, which I don't know why. That, that's why it's not explained. The biology is not explained there. Why? <laughs> now, um, 1C2 one talks about uh, what we did last class. What you want is that speciation and extinction have occurred throughout the history of life. So then we have to talk about that this process of creation of, of new types of life. Now, someone brought up this point uh, in, the, in the student questions. By the way, you keep using the student questions. I look at them. And so few people are putting things in there, that's, that's why I'm not spending a lot of time with it. I usually wait for it to fill out before I waste time going over it. But there's one up there right now that, it, by the way, it's in the AP Biology folder. Like it says that AP biology student question. There's a curiosity question that asks a very valid point, right? It was how can evolution, natural selection, which is a process that selects against things or for and for others, if you really think about it, that leads to less variety, not more. Are you with me? So uh, it needs variety to work because you have a large variety. If, 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 if without variety, there's no difference, there's no competition. The whole premise of it doesn't work, right? Also, why is it important for us to have, this is one of the uh, conclusion questions, why is it important for, for there to be phenotypical variation in order for species to survive the evolutionary process? What do you got? Uh, Vanessa Martinez, are you here? So why is it important for a species to have variety? How does the variety of the human species protect us from the evolutionary process? Very good, exactly right, keep relieving right? So I'm gonna pass, can you split this in half? You have half and one on side, half and one on that side, so that so if, if for space Exactly, so because it's necessary, basically, I, I on my, um, by the way, this, this uh, file with the comments, whether or not you have the comment addressed on your thing, I would read the comments that I made for everybody on the lab, because you learn a lot from those comments. And in, I answered the, um, the, my, the question myself on the comments, and I said, now this after the fact, you know, <coughs> and I said, well, if you, if you don't have, uh, the more variety you have, by the way, this is something that can be worked at any level. At the organism level, the more variety I have, the more I can deal with. So because humans have so much variety, we can live in so many environments and survive in those environments. But because the population of humans has so much variety, as a population, we can survive the process better, right? You can also apply the same concept at the ecosystem level. Because the rainforest is more biodiverse, 
It's harder for the rainforest to be destroyed, uh, obliterated, because of a single disease or a single invasive species or a single species that goes extinct. On the other hand, a food web that's less diverse, when one thing goes extinct, it sends a shockwave that everybody's affected. Are you with me? I'm trying to say. So variety protects the quality of life. It makes life tougher and more likely to survive the process of, of drama that life has to go through. Variety is the shield that allows us to survive the dagger of selection. Are you with me? Does that make sense? But his point is well made, or whoever made that question, right? Why is it that selection, how can selection create new types of life if it really just selects who gets to survive and it sounds like it's eliminating variation? Because selection is eliminating variation by selecting which variation exists in a specific place. But in another place, or another time, a different selection is happening, right? Which then makes both places be different when compared to each other. Are you with me? In addition to that, selection is not the only thing. There's also what? Mutations. And so that's why evolution is not a middle process, and that's why new information can be added. Last class I talked about, that's how it happens. You become isolated, and each of them undergoes a differentiated reproductive pro uh, uh, evolutionary process. And then when they are brought back together, if they are, have enough differences that they cannot um, no longer interbreed successfully, then they are already a different species. And I talked talk about the different types of reproductive isolation that exist and things like that, right? Um, I also... All right. So I also talk about, uh, um, briefly, about sympathetic, sympathetic and, and, and uh, allopatric uh, speciation and how allopatric is in true separate environments. But sympatratic is when usually there's like a genetic change. And I talk about how sometimes flowers or plants will, will hybridize their genomes and form a different species. And that's an example of something that would cause sympatratic speciation, right? So, and I even talked about some real experiments that have, that have been done to show that speciation occurs in worms and, and, and uh, plants and flowers and bugs and things like that. And my videos have more detail on all of this. Remember that if you are lost in a topic between Bozeman's, my videos, and other videos posted in the podcast folder, you have enough to review a true lecture, if that's what you're looking for, <coughs> with visuals and pictures and everything. Everything that's missing from this review is up online. So make sure you use those if you're lost, right? Today I want to quickly talk about, with the rest of the almost an hour that we have left, about the rest of 1C. This process of speciation has been occurring for a very long time, right? So remember I told you before that although evolution does not prove or have anything to do with bi biogenesis, in a way it's related to it. It suggests it. Because if you start accepting that we descend with multi that finches in the Galapagos all came from one ancestral finch. But because it colonized different environments, it had differential microevolutionary processes. And it was separated by thousands of miles, of, uh, not thousands of miles, by, by miles of ocean in between them, which diminished the communication of genes between the two islands. Right? Then, one island goes through, undergoes drift, the other one doesn't. One has a mutation, the other one doesn't. One has a selective pressure, the other one doesn't. Right? One has number of mating, the other one doesn't. Accelerate that for hundreds of thousands of years, the fish of one island is different from the fish of the other. Adaptive, matched to its environment, biogeographical evidence, right? So that kind of thing happens, why? Because of something called adaptive radiation, right? You have one type of life, and then it gets separated, and then, and then evolved differently. And then that type of life can do the same. And then that type of life can do the same. And then that type of life can do the same, and before you know it, you have hundreds of types of life for one type of life. But that, that is easy to see going forward, right? But the harder, more dangerous implication is that if you think about this going backwards, you think that this branch of finches came from benches, uh, uh, branches of other birds, right? Which came from branches of earlier reptiles which came from branches, share a common ancestor with uh, early ancestors of both reptiles and amphibians, which share common ancestors with the early ancestors of both amphibians and fish, which share, and if you keep going backwards, eventually you get back the original life forms that from all life came from. 
which suggests abiogenesis, right? Um, or at least a single origin for the tree of life. Right? Are you with what I'm trying to say? It doesn't prove, though, that that life was not created. But it also, there is no proof that it was created. It's an argument of faith at that point. But the arguments that I presented for abiogenesis in a few classes ago are actually based on something else. Hi. Right. So, are you guys with me, what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so now let's talk about our next, the next objective here. So, 1C1, one C, one C, um, one. speciation and extinction have occurred throughout the Earth's history. All right? So, do we have evidence of that? Do we have evidence that Earth has undergone extinctions? All right? So, let's see. Um, Justin. Right. So that, sh that shows that life has been changing. How about the show to show extinct? By the way, that's a fact you should write it down. It's evidence for speciation. Life is changing through the strata, right? And you can actually see transitions, right? Transition fossils. What can you also see that shows extinction in the strata? Uh, let's see, Isaac? Paul? What can you see in the strata that shows extinction? Maybe finding missing links. Well, that, that could, uh, how does that show extinction? You could, uh, like, <clears throat> see uh, how like, how it's changed, how it's been selected against it. Uh, okay, sure. but, all right, it's not, I see what you're saying, but what I'm looking for is something in the fossil record that shows extinction. Or how, how would that look like? Yeah, something you don't see anymore. Something you don't see anymore. <laughs> so, so that, it, it sounds like a stupid question, but you write down an FRQ, you get it right. But if you mean an example. Gotta have examples, I mean issues. Yes, that's, ab that's only about 100 trillion, right? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Dinosaurs are not around anymore. Ah, oh, such a shame, right? <laughs> I, such a shame. Because more stupid humans will probably die in face of the big monsters, you know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> Giant sloths? Giant sloths? They're not around anymore. Saber teeth, not around anymore, right? A mammoth, not around anymore, right? So these are examples. You make sure if you participate that you keep your head up until you get your damn Legos, right? Yes. Dodo birds. Okay, forget the fossil record. We have historical evidence of extinction. People have drawings of dodo birds in the in the Netherlands, in the New Zealand, right? And now we go to New Zealand, there are no more dodo birds. You know why, by the way? It, they killed them off, so it was over exploitation. It was also invasive species that competed with the dodo bird, and also habitat destruction. All together, you know, no dodo bird. All right, you're right. You're right. It's such a bad. You knew it, right? Give him a leg. Give him a leg. He has a good point. All right, because if I if I stop for everything, we don't move forward. But these are evidences of extinctions and speciation that have occurred. All right. What about speciation? Let's look at the saber tooth. How is the saber tooth? Versus the lion and tiger, an example of speciation. Because we know what? I love your history. Who said that? I love that. Because people will normally say lions came from saber teeth. Ah, that's not right. The saber tooth did not evolve to a lion. The branch of the saber tooth is dead forever. What happened is that at some point, lion and saber teeth <laughs> had a common ancestor, right? And then that's the branch from which lions most likely came from. Are you with me? It is possible, however, that the second, beginning of the last class, there's two types of macroevolution. There's the type where it changes, you know, over time in a straight line, and the animal changes progressively over time. And you can see that a lot in um, shells in the ocean fossil records <coughs> because you see them changing. And you, I, you, I showed you pictures of this online in the lecture series if you saw it, right? Shells are a great example. By the way, why are shells such an awesome fossil and so easy to find? So? Yes. It's the where they live. They get sedimented very easily. What about the actual organism that makes it easier for it to become fossilized? Yes? Right, it's kind of hard shell, right? And that's already kind of like rocky to begin with, right? By the way, it is very easy to find fossils in Florida. All you have to do is, is scrape up the top soil, and you will see coral, and that's a fossil, right? The limestone is basically a fossil, fossilized. Uh, uh, life forms, and that's where we live in, a huge coral reef. 
And it's kind of weird. Like, literally, you walk around the floor and you look at the ground as a seashell. But you're far from the ocean, but there it is. Right? <laughs> but it's even more weird when you're on top of the highest mountain in Colorado, and you look down, and there's a seashell. <laughs> right? What does that mean? It proves that the Earth has been changing over time. Geological processes. Right? And what happens? How can you have elephants in Asia and in Africa? How does that work? Right? Or maybe they used to be together and then separated. Right? Or why is it that you have cats, like the mountain lion here, and a jaguar in, 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 in um, South America, and then the leopard in Africa, so similar to each other? Why? Common accessory, right? But they're so separated geographically. Why? Pangea used to be together, right? So this is all evidence that the Earth has been changing, and with the changes that the Earth has been going through, the aggregations have been changing over time. If you if you're participating, make sure you get the news, right? So we have to have evidence. Now we talked about this on the other time. The speciation rates vary. What is that? I told you last class. This is a big one. This is a big one. Let's see. Christopher, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> give me a reason why, what are the two criteria, I said one, I give me one of the two criteria that you need to macro evolve. Um, wait, like the, like the rates? Like Not rates, just something that you need for, to, for a population to evolve. Okay. To a different kind of species. You need barriers, like. Barriers of some sort, very good. Like All right, let's go over the barriers really quick. Enzo, give me one. Barriers? Yeah, the separate populations. Physical barriers. Physical barriers, geographical separation. Mariah, give me another one. They can't have sex, right? Very good. How about Natalie? Temporal isolation. What's that an example of? Follow up with an example of temporal separation. What does that mean? Well, give me an example of two things that were separated by time, and that's why they can't have sex, and therefore they separate. You know what I'm talking about? Like what? Sorry? Different time zones? Sure. The organism is literally awake at a different time. What is that called? Yes? That's another way of thinking about it. You can't have sex with something that's from very ancient. That's another physical separation, yes? Nocturnal versus diurnal? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Another one? Uh, well, the American and Fowler's told well, they can breed, but they don't because they have different uh, reprodu like, the reproductive uh, cycles. cycles yeah. Right. Easiest one is flowering time, right? Flowers flower at different times, and that's why. They don't actually, by the way, flowers use this strategy majestically. Every single one of them blooms at different times. Even during the day, they open up and close up. And that prevents the bees and the pollinators to go on them in the wrong time. So even if you, even, their flowers are designed by coevolution, right? Design. They're, they co-evolve with their pollinators. So that the pollinator is attracted to that specific flower. So why? Because flowers don't really have sex. They use sex toys, right? <laughs> right? They use the, the, the little pollinators. So the flower can't go there. If I want to have sex with the other flower over there and I'm a flower, I can't just like, I can't do it. So I use a toy, right? But if I use a toy that another flower also uses, my pollen is going to the wrong place, right? It's like me doing it with a gorilla because the toy that I use, the gorilla is using. No, I need to go, roses need to do, the, do it with roses. So roses need to attract rose pollinators, right? It doesn't make sense. You can't have sex with someone who's not your type. It's not going to work. So the flowers make sure to attract a specific type of pollinator. Are you with me? But sometimes pollinators are eclectic. Because sometimes they want to get pollen or things from different flowers. So you know how the flowers evolve to avoid the, the pollinator going to the wrong flower and then going to her? By not being bloomed that time of the day, where the same time of the day as the pollinator would be. So the pollinator, the bees, is smart enough. He knows, I'm not going to go to the rose right now. I'm going to have trouble getting in. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so then it goes to the pollinator. So the blooming, it's matched, the timing. Very good. These types of reproductive isolations is one of the criteria that we need. What is the second thing that we need to make sure macro evolution happens? Uh, Catalina. Yes. Well, that's the way you talked about it. Right. Isolation. What is the second thing? And so, if I have a group here and a group over there, 
they will automatically evolve, all I have to do is separate them. They will, they will become different species. Okay. Now, what else is missing? Yes? Not necessarily environment. I like what you said, though. There needs to be a different environment. That's only selection. In general, different microevolution, which includes, it could be different environment, different mutations, different random mating, because evolution does not happen only because of selection, right? But we call this differentiated microevolutionary mechanisms. And that's actually a big key term for it. Anybody knows from watching the videos what is it called? No? All right. I forgot, that's why I'm asking. But it's, 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 it's this, the vicarians is what it's called. All right? That two different organisms are under different conditions over time. And that's what causes their history, their natural history to, to be different. All right? And they evolve differently, but they have to be physically isolated or isolated by other type of variants. Right? So now, this continues to happen over the history of time. All right? Now, what kind of slowed that down then? What can slow down? The rate of, of arrival of that speciation. By that, yes? G flow. Like, G flow, this is, hold on. What kind of G flow? If I got this, this population, name population view over here, there's an activity that I, can, I do this for biology honors that really communicates that, but you guys you know, we go so fast, there's no time for that. We do plenty of labs already. But, anyways, if I have a G flow coming into this population, but not into that one, that's causing vicariance. That's not what I'm talking about. Gene flow is a mechanism of microevolution, and it can accelerate the evolutionary process. Right? Well, the kind of gene flow that slows things down is what? Why is the human population evolving so slowly? Now, compared to previous times. <coughs> right? Yes? No, it's not that. Yes? That's right. And we exchange genes. There's no vicariance, there's no physical separation because we, we migrate all back and forth. Right? So that causes a slowdown of the process, although we have other mechanisms that speed up the process. But it slows down. The human genome is very curious. And there's actually new science being done on why is it that there seems to be large punctuated equilibrium leaps in evolutionary of humans. The little punctuated equilibrium is when evolution happens in right quick steps. And it seems that the plasticity of the human genome allows for quick evolutionary steps. I'll talk more about this when we do genetics later in the year. But it's very interesting. But either way, archiving that for now, right? Gene flow between the isolated populations is what causes the problem of slowing down the evolutionary rate. So what accelerates the evolutionary rate? What makes it very fast? They will, they will break and become very different species. I told you last class of something that blocks that very, if that muta a mutation happens in this, it will cause very quickly isolation. Yes? Uh, the amount of chromosomes, right? Genetic differences. What else could do that? Um, yes. Isn't it like uh, I, I forgot the other word? It's like reinforcement. There's something else. No, I'm talking about something else. Behavioral isolation. Because if I don't know how to have sex with that person, it's not going to happen. And so there's sometimes it's as simple as changing the color so you don't recognize the other species as your own, or changing the way you dance, or something that makes the other, the other population not recognize you, and that's it. And, and see, animals are kind of dumb when it comes to having sex, right? They just kind of like, there's even some plants that pretend to mimic the sex organ of bugs, so the bug will go inside of it thinking that it's doing having sex with something else, right? Animals just act based on fixed action patterns. They are, they are, they have what they call instinct of reproduction, right? But if you modify even a small mutation, changes that instinct, then you look at someone else and you're like, how do I have sex with them? Right? You don't know. I experienced this many times in my lifetime. <laughs> you, know, you go online, you try to pick up a date with a girl, and I'm a nerd, and I just can't relate to the supermodel. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> once I did it a model. Once. No way. Yes. I have pictures to prove it. Right? <laughs> so once I did the model, and then it was like the worst, because, you know, the, the high demands, and I'm not talking about, you know, sexual stuff. I'm talking about physical behavioral stuff that we just didn't, and high, and high maintenance, uh, you know, she wasn't dumb, she was actually pretty smart, but like, damn, you know, and, and I'm not the jealous type, but like, damn, like, it's hard, it's hard, because like, you're walking through the place that she's taking pictures, right? 
And there's the guy. And he's like the picture perfection. Even you look at him and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, you got the pictures of him. All right, that's cool. All right, it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. But anyways, behavior isolation. It exists even in us. Remember that. All right, continuing. These things can vary the rate. So across time, sometimes the rate slows down, sometimes the rate speeds speed up. You know what also speeds up the rate of evolution? Need. Right? Here's the thing. Competition. If, exactly. Competition. Very good. So what happens when there isn't competition? When everything is out for the grab, then, let's think about it. Let's say I clear all the niches. The rainforest is gone. All the niches that were there are available for new lives to come through. It's a free-for-all game where all the life forms get split. Now, this is super interesting, and it happens through the history of evolution. So you have a, let's think about the rainforest as one big niche diagram, right? And then before, at first, there was only three niches in the entire rainforest to be occupied by three types of life. Mass extinction happens. This type survived due to the land, do not. These niches become available, right? That can now occupy those niches if it involves mutations that allow them to do so, right? But then different ones can, be, can evolve. Maybe one evolved to take or that one or whatever. And now, instead of having one type of life form, you have more. Are you with me? Every time a max extinction takes place and niches become available, each niche doesn't have to split exactly how it was split before. Are you with me? So every mass extinction actually increases the variety of life. Isn't that confusing? Because you would think that mass extinctions will destroy life. They do. But after, you have a bunch of open niches which don't have to be divvied up the same way they were before. Are you with me? So they can actually, so if you look at a, ra a graph of the evolutionary history of biodiversity in our planet, you start with very little life, of course, and as soon as cellular respiration kicks in, you have the, and you have multicellular life, and you have sex, and you have all of those things we talked about, which are the basic, basic early advancements of life, there's a huge explosion called the Cambrian explosion. And life just goes crazy like that. But then there is an ex a Devonian next to mass extinction, which crashes the life a lot. But then afterwards, an even bigger explosion. And then like another extinction, and the biggest explosion. And then, you see, every time there's a mass extinction, the niches are clear, and then more things evolve to fill those niches. Right? So, is mass extinction a good or a bad thing? Uh, what do you think, Isaac? Is it a bad thing? I like your answer, Isaac. All right. That's right. Annabelle, where's Annabelle? Why is it a bad thing? For who is it a bad thing? That's right. And who is usually going extinct? Let's think about it. Why is the top usually going extinct? Good, Mariah, give her a little. Why is the top usually going extinct? Uh, you didn't say anything yet. Why the top? You have to gather more That's right. Why? Ecology. The top needs more energy to be specialized, to be faster, to be stronger. Something so they can be on top. But they get less energy efficiency in each tra energy transfer because they eat at the top of the layer where you only get 0.1% of the energy by ecology standards, right? So you need more and get less. There's less of you. When the energy crashes because of, of a mass extinction, everything, whole thing goes down. The top is the first one. Not the first one, but it always goes. Put it to the top now. Think about that. Now, another one, another one to think about. Another well, I don't know if they're at the top. Okay, let's stop talking about who's on top. It's going to get weird. But after that, uh, but one thing I will tell you for sure is this. The worst mass extinction in the history of our planet was the permanent mass extinction. Nobody's for sure about what happened. But it happened around the time Pangea was formed. Most people think it has something to do with volcanic eruptions that occur at the time. Perhaps global disease or changes in the, in the, uh, uh, the composition of the gases of the oceans. All of that associated with uh, volcanic eruptions and epidemics and things like that. Whatever the reason may be, over a billion, a billion years, species went extinct at the rate of 100 species per year. And over a period of a billion years, 90% of ocean water and 70% of land water about went extinct. That was close. That was a close call. Life almost didn't make it out with that one. The but the thing is that it's really hard to eliminate life. Really hard. Did I tell you guys about the whole water on my thing and how you know it? You're not even going to look at what it is in there? Yeah. I took the wire, right? Yeah. 
because the moment there's life, and we go there, we meet a, a, you know, brother contaminated with human bacteria, right? So we want to try to stop that from happening because bacteria is so damn good at surviving in places. Are you with me? And so we're going to try, but that's the thing. You would really need, like, a massive disaster. Like, you like, gamma rays a burst that hits the earth that on. Or a supernova that explodes near next door and there's no stars for candidates for that. Or a traveling black hole that just sucks us up. You know? Or the whole atmosphere just goes missing in a second for some reason over a period of time. Or the sun going, going uh, red giant like it's going to go someday. Or a big solar flare but it has to be a massive one that engulfs the earth. Life can make it in most situations. You know, a strike, volcanic eruptions, life will make it. Some of it will make it. I think. I will to battle life on that. Life is resourceful. But there's so, there's so much variety, right? That something can survive. Unless the whole abiotic conditions are eliminated. No water, no, you know what I'm saying? All the basic things you absolutely need to have life. But that doesn't mean all life makes it. And the Permian extension was closed. Last year, by most conservative counts, right, we lost over 130 different species among mammals, birds, Plants, bugs, amphibians. That rate is bigger than the permanent extinction average rate. So the rate of current extinction is worse than the permanent mass extinction. Right? And that has been happening for not so long, but as long as it lasts long enough, it could be worse than the permanent. The permanent extinction is only worse because it lasted a long time. But at the current rates, we are going, animals are going to extinct faster than they were between over-exploitation, habitat destruction, global warming, ozone layer depletion, um, uh, pollution, urbanization, right? Habitat fragmentation, and a million other reasons, invasive species, a pathogen spread, and every other screwed up thing that humans do, the human, the world, the world is suffering. But is it a bad thing? Yes. Is it a bad thing? Now let's go back to the argument we're making. For who? It's bad. It's bad for the top, isn't it? It's bad for us. Now let's talk about niches. So what caused the? Everybody knows this one. What caused the, the big uh, Cretaceous extinction? Anybody knows this one? Dinosaurs. What caused that one? Uh, meteor. They say it was a meteor. It could have been a disease, but they, most people think it was a big meteor that hit uh, near Mexico, right? Eradicated covered the earth with dust for so many years, eradicated a lot of productivity, and it caused a shock with cascade effects on the food webs, and the top did not make it. The dinosaurs <laughs> kind of went extinct. Balls. Are there dinosaurs around today? Yeah, yeah. yeah they're called birds. All right? They're called birds. All right? All right? So there are still lots of life that existed back then uh, that came from the same branches the dinosaurs come from. So the dinosaurs are not extinct. They're just different. Okay? For the dinosaurs we think of, or the dinosaurs when it's thinking. Now, food for thought, that was a meteor spread. Right? And then there's a disease, there's volcanic eruption, there's permanent extinction. Who's causing this extinction? What natural disaster? Humans. Alright. So maybe maybe that's our niche. To destroy? <laughs> right? Maybe that's our purpose. Maybe we are here to hit the reset button. So the new variety comes after us. Or maybe we are here to be smarter and do something about it, right? Okay. Um, every quarter, you have to do something that's called a bioethics essay and uh, something that's called an uh, abstract review, okay? And that's basically an, ass an essay where you are, I'm going to tell you the instructions later, next class probably, but it's basically you have to research a paper about something that we talked about, and then you know, that's the bioethics review, that's the research abstract part. And then the other part is that you have to uh, you have to write an opinion paper on the ethics of an issue, right? And our first one is going to be about this, about the human impact in the in the natural history of this planet. Not right now, the big picture of why we're here for and where we're going, and where you fit with all of that. So that's going to be our first one. It's due at the end of the quarter. The greatest probably only going to be counted on the second quarter, but it's due at the end of the quarter, right? Continuing then our discussion here, because we have to talk about these examples. We already did the five mixed extinctions. Uh, speciation rates are rapid at times, right? Um, due to a lot of ecological stress, 
the five magic changes, and we talk about human impact on ecosystems and species extinction rates. Mm -hmm. So we just did that. But I would also like to add a few more things that have caused the human history, the, the natural history to change. Let's talk about this. Let's see if you guys can help out. Karina, tell me something from the chapter that you read, chapter 26, that tells us why animals have changed over time. Uh, uh, cycle. Something that happened to the earth that caused animals to change a lot, other than massive things. So we talked about leopards and geppers. Why was that? Oh, that was like because they moved and they all have to like... What was that called? Yeah. What's that called? Continental, Continental drift. drift. Let's think about that one for a second. Continental drift. So what does that mean? Continentals are undergoing bottleneck effects? No, that's a different drift. Right? Did you catch my drift? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> There's three different types of drift in one sentence. But that... Um, and we could also drift in a car, right? But that's different. All right? So... Um, or drift your focus somewhere else. Or let's try to actually stay here. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is... Um, when the continent just move, they move because of plate tectonics, of course. Where do they move to? Same place they used to be? So what's going to change about the continent? The, the actual mass. What could change about it? The climate. The ocean currents. They exist because of the oceans that exist. But if you're moving the oceans around, what's going to happen with the currents? What's going to happen to the heat absorption patterns that cause global winds? Who? Who is this? Sherry Moglin? And Jennifer Nisa, pass it to her, please. And then Samantha. All right, pass it to Jennifer. So that's All right, listen up. So do you understand that causes climate change, which changes the pressure that are put in the organism? <coughs> right? OK, what other type of global change could change life? Why are there no giant sloths anymore? What's the story there? What killed them? It wasn't that. Why are the, why are the, um, Mammoths not anymore. Actually, it wasn't an ice age that caused it. It was the opposite. A warming of the weather, right? That happened since that ice age, right? And that's kind of like a lot of life. About 20,000 years ago, giant mammal life existed in this planet, right? Lots of types. It was not just the moth. There was a lot of giant life. And it kind of always just, you know, went extinct, right? By the way, did you guys know that there are, there's actually a real mammoth? Like an actual, not like a bones of the mammoth, but the entire thing, you can go see it. Are they trying to like... Uh, no, they found one on ice, an entire one. Actually, more than one. Well, they found yeah. a baby one too in Siberia. But they found a large, complete mammoth with DNA and everything. Right? And it's actually in a museum now. Right? I'm not sure, but you can see it. You know? And the baby one is being worked on still, but they found this. So like, just so you know. Right? So, okay. Continue. So global weather change. What causes this global weather change? Is it our humans? We didn't cause that one. But global warming is just a thing. It happens because of what? Changes in absorption. The sun could change, right? The orbit could change, right? It's a lot of different things that could happen. Then there's volcanic eruptions, meteor strikes. Let's talk about things that could kill us today. Are you ready? Things that could kill us today. All right, anybody knows about something that's in the Midwest of the United States that will kill us all? Oh, oh, the park. Yes, the Yellowstone yeah. Park. What about it? It is a super volcano. If it explodes, I want you to understand this. Okay, get a map when you go home today and understand this. If it explodes, the six states that surround it will go basically completely obliterated by volcanic ash and smoke. The ash will come here to Florida. All right? The entire Northern American uh, continent will be covered with volcanic ash. The entire Northern Hemisphere will become dark. And because of global wind patterns, eventually, the entire world will go dark. It will cause an ice age that could last anything between 3 and 30 years. Agricultural productivity will be 10% of what it could be. That happened in a smaller scale because of, of a big volcano in the Philippines in the 1800s. And then we got the Black Plague and a bunch of other bad stuff that happened in the Middle Ages because of it, 1700s. Right? The second wave of the plague. That's crazy. And that could happen today. Right? Because it's actually the thing is that, but some indication it's going to happen anytime soon. But it's overdue because the Yellowstone Park has exploded on average, every certain amount of time. And it's been overdue for a very long time. 
So mm -hmm. it is only a matter of time until this thing goes. So you know, God bless America, right? Mm -hmm. What America? It's, it's a blimp in the history of time. It's doomed. America will not be here forever because the Yellowstone Park will explode. It's a matter of time. Are you with me? Have you thought about that? Okay? So you know, like all these people going to think we're going to protect our state, our, our country. Right? It's true. But this is why country lines are so stupid. Because what's going to happen when all the Americans need a place to go? And then, now it's war in Syria. Right? And they need refugees. One day we will be refugees. One day we're going to turn to your neighbor and say, there's bread for you or for me. And then who's in America now? Right? Think about those things. Global. One is already happening right now. You go to Alton Road, right, on, 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 on full moon. You can't drive on Alton Road on full moon. You know why? Oh, because it floods. Because of the high tide. Because the ocean level is rising. And people don't know, but Miami Beach is already due. And I'm not talking yeah. five years, right? 50 years. I'm talking five years. Five, ten years at this rate on the water. There's no point in fixing the road. You've got to build a wall. Yeah. Because the water's coming. <laughs> the water is coming. And people that don't see it coming, it's crazy. It's coming. You know why the beach is still there? Because we keep putting sand on it. Yeah. You know, it's $10 million a year just to preserve the section between 5th Street and 15th Street. Where, um... Nikki Beaches, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right there, that section is $10 million a year just to keep that to reach alive. The keys are even worse. <laughs> oh my God. All right? In fact, the worst investment you can do is buy a house in Florida. It's not going to be here 50 years to be for you to collect the, the mortgage, whatever <laughs> thing. Small term investments only, please. <laughs> All right? So it's something to think about. Seriously, go to the mountains. All right. So, so um, how about how about uh, epidemiology, right? You saw how scary it was when uh, Ebola struck, right? Any of these things can cause things to change, right? So let's just think about that. One last thing I'm going to talk about is the one C three. Populations of organisms have continually to continue to evolve. So now I have to talk about evidence that this is happening now. That life is evolving today. And this is not some storybook style story that happened a long time ago. So let's talk about that. So it says here, scientific evidence supports the idea that evolution has occurred in all species. So let's talk about this evidence. Natalie Saborio. Where are you? Give me something that proves that you have evolved, that you evolved from something else. Just look at yourself and tell me something. What? Thumbs. Right? Because... We have the same thumbs that monkeys have, but other organisms don't have them, right? It's a proof that you have evolved. Good. Now give me another proof that humans have evolved. Yes? Yes, we have four limbs because we come from organisms that originally had four limbs, right? Yes? Tell let's go more vestigial here. Yes? Our appendix, right? What else? Our tailbone, right? Yes? All right, somebody talk about the embryo stuff. The embryo stuff. You, who brought the embryo stuff out last time? Yes? <laughs> Fish embryos and human embryos at the beginning are look the same. We even have what? Gills. 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 Right? No, no, Alright, because that's a good evidence that we evolved. But you can do this for anything that's alive. But what is the ultimate evidence that science uses today to prove our relationship to everything? DNA. DNA. Because we have DNA of bacteria in us. Because if we give bacteria pieces of our DNA, they can make copies of it. If we do that, to make insulin. If you have a diabetic friend or you're diabetic yourself, think the bacteria for it, because they're the ones that make your insulin. Why? Because we put our DNA in them and they start making it for us. Because of the universality of the code. Conserve core structures and processes. We do that stuff. It's going to be the next FRQ. Next one. Right? Evidence that evolution is continuing to occur. Chemical resistance. But there's lots of types. Right? Give me one type of chemical resistance that's talked about a lot. And on this? What? Yeah. Things becoming resistant to chemicals. Uh, bacteria. bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics. We put it on aquaculture. We put it on the cows. We put it on the chicken. Because they're living in close quarters, in inhumane situations. And they get sick a lot because of, of, the, of the closeness of there. Right? So to prevent disease, we get use it. 
but then that causes bacteria to become resistant to natural selection, right? And now, 50 years later, the panacea, it used to be called the panacea. You have an infection, don't worry about it. Penicillin has it. You don't worry about it, you're fine. Syphilis, that's ah, okay, just got a penicillin shot. That's how people used to think about it when it came out, I'm serious. It wasn't a problem, right? If you ask, I watched a documentary on, on San Francisco's um, kind of sexual life in, in, in the early 80s before, before AIDS became a thing, right? And they literally had that kind of thing where you went to go to the bathhouses and you would have some sex with each other and they would get STDs and they were like, eh, it's no problem. Just go to the doctor and get a penicillin shot. Penicillin doesn't work half the time anymore. Right? And then there's ampicillin that all doesn't work, 30% of the time doesn't work anymore. You know what the funny part is? We get those things from fungus. And fungus that we find inside the rainforests, which are being destroyed by us. So even as we have less antibiotics to use, we have less sources of them. Thank God for bio plants, because we can engineer all. But eventually, this battle might be a battle that we're going to have trouble catching up with. All right. Let's talk about, I, in my front yard, I have herbs. Lots of herbs that I don't want to have, right? <laughs> just, just herbs. <laughs> so I have a little garden going on that I'm trying to keep alive. There's always these damn little things I don't want there, right? So one thing I can do is spray herbicide. Someone tell me why that's a bad idea. Yes. And eventually the herbs will what? <laughs> Just grow. So farmers, in an attempt to get rid of her, the herbs, they pull them out. You see the one that's not supposed to be there? Early, when you just plant it, right? They don't, and with our plants, what do we do when there's two more than two in one place? What do we do with the other one? Take it out, because it, the competition will hurt them, right? So that's what they do. Early, as soon as they, they walk the entire field, they look for herbs and they pull them out. <laughs> but what if they, what is going to happen because of that? Think about it. They're going to change to look like the other ones. Because any herb that looks just, that has a mutation, that makes it look similar to the other one, okay. will be selected for by that process. Are you with me? Yes. I will do it in a second. So sorry. All right? Are you with me? Alright? So if I do that, eventually the herbs start looking like the original ones. They mimic. Right? So a lot of the herbs that grow in wheat fields look just like wheat. You can't even tell them apart. Because of this years of artificial selection by the inadvertent artificial selection. The same thing with uh, pesticide resistance and pests and everything else. Continuing, emergent diseases. N1H1, the swine flu, right? Three years ago, almost died of the damn thing. You <laughs> stupid students getting sick every year. I can't stand you. I don't know why I do this job. Every <laughs> single year I catch the flu. I'm waiting for it this year. It doesn't happen yet. Right? <laughs> but every year I catch the flu. And every year something different. Every year there's a new flu. How is that possible? How can there be a new flu every year if evolution doesn't happen? It does happen. Yeah. <laughs> That's the point. That's the point. It does happen. They come out of new, because there's a strong pressure for negative selection. If a flu doesn't change, it goes extinct. So it has to keep changing, right? And it's an RNA virus, it, it mutates very quickly, so it changes very quickly. Yes, a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about this the other day, that you can get chicken pox. <laughs> uh -huh. You know how you can get chicken pox twice? Uh -huh. So is chicken pox not evolved? You're very unlikely to get chicken pox twice, first of all, right? Because your immune system has, has built a defense against it. But if your immune system is depleted, and you don't have the antibiotics anymore, you can certainly get it twice. Happens to each of you patients all the time. What? But that's different, but it's a second version of the yeah. disease that affects something else later on in life. And that's what the shingles in the, what's it called? Shingles and something else. I forgot the name of the disease. But the point is, you're confusing evolution with adaptation within an organism, right? Yes, you can get it twice if it's a different strain of chicken pox, right? Yeah. But for that, it would have to change enough that the antibodies that you have no longer recognize the original strain. And, and that's difficult for any for anything to do. But you can get the flu every year. But chickenpox and flu are different monsters, right? Chickenpox is a DNA viruses with a very complex protein structure that's very similar in every single type of chickenpox. Meanwhile, the flu virus is a very highly mutated virus that's like an RNA virus. Like the, the, the HIV virus and the Ebola virus are also RNA viruses. We'll learn more about that later in the year. So that's I mean, what, how right? they came up with the vaccine is he did smallpox. Right. 
The church, in fact, they will use a similar virus to the chicken to pox make virus. the chickenpox vaccine. So they work on similar mechanisms. Right, and you're going to see. That's a good question. It's a very good question. Yeah. Did you get legal? Right. <laughs> you could absolutely get chickenpox again if it's a different strand of it. In fact, let me tell you something about HIV. Uh, you have one more thing about, but this is important. People thought, okay, or in back to San Francisco, when people first got HIV, they thought, oh, you have HIV, I have HIV. Okay, fine. Let's go back to the sex life from before because I don't have to worry about it because we both have it. But the thing is that he's taking a medicine regimen and I'm taking a different medicine regimen. And then that causes his virus to evolve different from my virus, the carriers. Right? Now I can actually get, it, get his second strain of the virus. And now I have two types of HIV at the same time. That's happened. It's called a Many super times. virus. It's called super virus. Yeah. Right? And then so because the virus is coated in fat cells sometimes, they literally would infect the cell at the same time. Now you have hybridization. And now you have a third type of virus. Right? So actually, there are multiple types of HIV, all because of this. Yeah. So it's actually even more important to use protection after you get it, you know? Which, by the way, shows evolution, macroevolution of the virus, if you can think about it. Last but not least. You keep uh, saying last but not least. Yes. <laughs> Observe the rational phenotypical change in the population, all right? For example, we notice that the Galapagos Islands are cha have changed throughout history to a certain pattern, right? Or the, the moths, right, have changed to a certain pattern. We have actual observed examples of populations changing. I give an example of the uh, of the fly that changed because of the, they went to a different type of uh, food, the food source, right? And it became isolated because of that. So, and finally, uh, even among eukaryotes, you can look at the history of eukaryotes and see examples of progressive, progressive evolution. Later in the year, we'll talk about the systems that we have and how they work together to integrate to save us energy. And I'm going to bring this back, but if you look at the heart chambers, for example, right? Let's just look at heart chambers. Fish has a single, uh, well actually, worms, they have a heart that just pumps, just squeezes. But that means some blood goes backwards. So by the time you get the fish, right, and there's two chambers. One to receive the blood, and there's a valve here that prevents them from going backwards, and another one to send the blood flow, right? Well, that, that's better. But still, because that we have the lungs in more higher animals, there was a need for a better, more efficient system. In fact, until the cardiovascular system evolved a little more, life on land with lungs was not very possible, and things couldn't get very big. That's why amphibians are so small, because their cardiovascular system has improvements, but not as good improvements as reptiles and mammals have. Because we'll talk more about this later, because I only have five minutes, but next class I'll start with this, and talk about how if you look at the history of eukaryotic life by looking at progressive evolutionary steps at higher and higher classes of organisms, you can see the progression that evolution has made, right, to improve the system so that you can become more efficient. You can see this in the digestive system, you can see it in the cardiovascular system, you can see all the other systems. And it's also a concept that we'll bring back later in the year. Alright? So next class we have to talk about 1v1, but we also have to talk about the lab. And so and we only have less time because of early release. I will prioritize the labs so you guys get how to start it. We might postpone in 1v1, but just in case, come ready for 1v1. Either way, there'll be no effort. Next time, just more discussion. In 1v1, which is classification. All right? I'll see you guys then. Thank you for listening. Thank you for a great class. And I'll see you next time. Don't forget. Thanks, guys. I study every single day because I'm scared you hate. Give me Wi-Fi. Yes. Because I always...